We are so glad to be back in church, man. I've been wanting to line dance or run hot laps or something. I don't know, man. It's been it's been a while. I uh, uh, tithes and offerings. Yeah, I guess we could do that right now. Uh, why don't we do that? Go ahead, Todd. Come on up, you guys. Come on up, and I'll. I'll pray through. I'll tell you guys a story. That's been, I, listen, you guys have been amazing throughout this whole this whole COVID thing, this whole uh, thing where we've been quarantined and, and uh, sheltering it in place, kind of a thing. So, um, Amen, Amen. Thank you, Father God, for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, that uh, as we come into the flow of your Spirit and of your presence, Lord God, we. Uh, we just celebrate, Lord God, what you're doing here this morning and what you've done. We love being back in your house with our family. And Lord God, just to uh, be in your presence corporately, it's wonderful that we can worship you on our own and, and, and just have that personal, intimate time with you and fellowship in your spirit, Lord God. But it's so good when we can come together as a church family. And Lord God, be a part of uh, a part of what you're doing as we as we gather and we worship corporately. Thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness and the offerings and the tithes to keep everything going. And and while everything else was shut down, Lord God, this church, this group, this congregation was so faithful. So thank you for their giving hearts, Lord God. And we just pray blessing upon the offering, blessing upon the gift and the giver. We receive it in the name of Jesus. And everyone called it blessed, said amen. So be it again. Amen. So the other day I got a phone call I'd heard about, a phone call had come into the office and they was talking about uh, whoever it was. I don't know for sure. Man, man, this might not have happened here, but you know, hey, work with me. It's uh, I got to tell a couple of funny stories, man. I've been building on this for like the last seven weeks. So anyway, so this is kind of the way it sounds, you know. Uh, so there's this phone call comes into the office, and and whoever's on the other end says we'd like to talk to the head hog at the trough. And they said, listen, we don't use that kind of language around here. If you're talking about the pastor, we do not call him the head hog at the trough. And so just talking about giving and all that right there. And they said, well, we just wanted to talk to the head hog at the trough because we wanted to make a $5,000 donation. And about that time, said, welcome. He, he just, Porky just walked in. So anyway, so thank you for your giving. We appreciate it and all that right there. So you guys have been stellar all the way through this. Thanks to everybody that helped come do on the cleanup and and just for taking care of one another, we heard a lot of amazing, amazing things about people just taking care of one another, and 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 so that's 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 so good, so good. So, uh, Bob, you taking your class down today? All right, you guys are gone. We love you. Uh, I think uh, youth are staying over. I believe that is correct. Youth are staying here today, and then so here's what we want to do for the moms. Uh, Ladies, there's some, some devotionals up here on the altars on both sides. So we've had prayer, we've spoken blessing, and we love you. We want to give you, just applaud you for your love and your work. So if you would, ladies, moms, grandmas, if you would, please come and grab you a devotional up here. And we want to send something home with you. Just a small gift to say thank you for what you do all throughout the year. Let's give them a hand clap as they come. We love our moms. We love our grandmothers. Please come. Please come. There's plenty. There's plenty for everyone. Come get you one. We'll have some left over. We do every year. And so just grab you, grab you a devotion there. I personally have not read them myself yet. I usually get a hold of Marsha's, and I really, I do. I like, I like to read it. Kind of figure out what's going on in you women's brain sometimes. I've not done that yet, but anyway, good stuff, good stuff. Anybody happy to be back in church today? Yeah. Me too. Me too. My goodness. Now, we're going to have a little bit of fun with this like we always do. We want to celebrate uh, what we traditionally call our more mature mother. Um, I would hate to say, you know. And so, and the way that we'll do that is, is we'll recognize uh, that person who has been a mom longer than anyone else. That is, you know, that, that's here. And so any of the moms that are here, uh, any moms, you've been a mother 
for over 50 years. Anybody got the 50-year number? I got two that's getting the 50-year plus. Got three. Anybody else I'm seeing through four? All right, anybody, anybody hit 55? Anybody got 55? Still got some in the race right here. Uh, 56. Been mom longer than 56. Got 56. All right, 56 right on the money. 60? Can anybody beat 60? All right, this gal right here. Listen, for you younger moms, if you need wisdom, this is the lady you go talk to right here. All right, so are they all the same? That's for the that's for that's for Miss Nancy had your name on it. Don't I look nice carrying that bag right there? So that challenges my uh, yeah. All right. Now then the next one is for the mom who needs uh, medication. We have a bag there. It's for the most children. Well, yeah. Hey, you're out of this race right here. Yeah, that's the way I was for all of you. But you know, you're t maybe it shouldn't be for the amount of kids. Maybe it should be for the amount of issues they've created in your life. I don't know how we would number that. How many? Any, anybody here got? Anybody here got the number, at home. the number at home? Yeah, yeah. Anybody got ten? Got ten kids? Nine? Nine? Eight? You guys are gonna have to get to work. All right. <laughs> Church growth. Come on, work with seven. Six, surely to goodness we can get a five. I got a five in early service. A five, yeah! All right, which one is it? Right here. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Amen. All right, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. All right, now the next one is for the youngest. Anybody carrying? How many of y'all believe that life starts at conception? Amen. So we're going to start right here. Anybody carrying your first child? This is the newest mom. This is the one that has the deer in the headlights look. I'm scanning the crowd right now to see. It's like, oh, Lord, what's happening? All right. Anybody carrying your first? Anybody? Anybody had one? You got one here that's under one year. One year. Anybody? All right. Got Casey. Yeah. First, let me, let me qualify. First one under one year. Yeah, you got a whole herd, man. Thank you. You, you get a, you get an attaboy. All right, anybody else that's got one, one, your first one under one year. All right, Tatum, come here, baby. I'll bring it to you. You don't have to get up. This is JoJo. Everybody say hi, JoJo. JoJo. Hi, beautiful baby. Amen. Welcome to the house of God. It's good. Thank you, honey. We love you guys. Let's give our moms a hand again, and we're going to get into this thing. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And if you're watching on television or online or something like that, and say, I could have beat all of them right there, you should be at church on next Mother's Day. All right? That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. All right, so open in your Bibles. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, while you're opening there, it may take you a little while to get back into the habit of turning in your Scripture. I don't know how much you've been working on this whole thing. We're Matthew, chapter 16, and we're going to paraphrase, starting at verse 13 just a little bit, get to work on that. I, I've, uh, I'm so glad I'm not having to be a televangelist. I'll just be honest with you right now. I, I, and I'm not, I'm not trying to categorize any things, but um, I'd had some different people saying, well, you're going to go on into televangelism and all that whole kind of a thing there? And I told them, no, absolutely not. I've been hearing stories about televangelists. And uh, the, the last one that I heard had to do with the COVID thing. There was a Hindu priest, a Jewish rabbi, and a televangelist. How many of y'all know where we're going with this one? We'll have a little fun with it. Don't work with me. It has absolutely nothing to do with the sermon. I've just been working on stuff for seven weeks now, and I've got to get some of this off my chest. So this Hindu priest, this Jewish rabbi, and this televangelist are all traveling together, and because of the COVID thing, they cannot find a room anywhere, so they find a farmer that has a room but only two beds. So they're figuring out between them who's going to go out and stay in the barn. The farmer says, you can all stay here, but somebody's going to have to sleep in the barn. So the Hindu priest offers to go. First of all, I'll go to the barn. He goes out to the barn just a little bit. There's a knock at the door. They open the door. It's the Hindu priest. He's back in. I can't stay in the barn. There's a cow out there. Cows are sacred. I can't stay in a sacred place with a cow. So somebody else will have to go out. So the Jewish rabbi... He's next. He says, well, you know, I'll go out there. It's not a problem. I'm, I'm okay with all of that right there. I'll go out to the barn. He goes out a little bit. He's right back door. Knock. Jewish rabbi, there's a hog out there, and it would not be kosher for me to stay in the barn with a hog. 
And so I just, I can't do that. That would violate everything. And so the televangelist says, all right, I'll have to get my makeup off and do all of that. But anyway, I'm going to go on out to the barn. And so he goes out to the barn and just a little bit, again, same thing, knock at the door, open the door up, and it's the hog and the pig. They are not staying in the barn with the televangelist. So... Don't shout me down, man. I'm just, I'll be here all week, folks. I'll be here all week. So, has absolutely nothing to do with the sermon. I just thought it was funny. So, if you didn't like it, just get over it. That's all I can tell you. We're going to start a series today. All right. Got that off my chest. I'll have some more next week. <laughs> How many of y'all know laughter does good like a medicine? Some of you need to take a dose. Get over it, man. It's good to be in the house of God. I'm having fun today. Woo! Joy of the Lord's my strength. I like it. So um, we're going to start a series. And in this series, we're going to talk about the prevailing church. Everybody say the prevailing church. How many of y'all believe that God has called the church to prevail? Whenever we look at this passage of Scripture, there's, a, there's, there's some really neat stuff here. There's two questions that Jesus asked. And, and, and they're relevant to today. They, they literally translate for 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago, Jesus asked these questions, but they are still relevant today. What you believe, we say this all the time, and I want to continue to say it to reinforce it. What you believe is important, and what you do with what you believe is just as important. What you believe is important, and what you do with what you believe is just as important. So I'm going to paraphrase for time's sake. You can just roughly follow along. This is Matthew 16, 13. First question, Jesus asked this question, and he says, Who do men say that I am? How many of y'all know there's all kinds of opinions in this earth about who Jesus is? Who do you say? The second question, and he, he gives this to his disciples, he says, who do you say? See, their response was, well, some say you're one of the prophets, you're Jeremiah, you're Isaiah, you're Elias, you're, you're one of the prophets. And he was a prophet, but he was much more than that. He was the son of God, his Messiah. And so then he comes and he makes the question personal and he leans in and I think he makes eye contact at this point and he says, who do you say I am? Who do you say he is? What you believe about the Son of God will make all the difference in your life and in your eternity. Anybody say amen? amen? It makes all the difference here and all the difference there. Jesus is making deposits. He has created relationship within the lives of the disciples, but he is bringing to a culmination all of these things that he's been pouring into them, and the answer that they give him, and actually it is Peter that gives him the correct response. You see, Peter's been taught since he's a little child, here are the things that you look for. There is a Messiah. There is an anointed one that will be coming. The scribes and the rabbis have been teaching and teaching. And as a little Jewish boy growing up, now Peter's getting on in years just a little bit. And Peter's response to who do you say that I am, his response is absolutely point right on the nail on the head, right that kind of a thing. And he says, you're the Christ. Everybody say the Christ. You are the anointed Messiah. You're the one that I've been being taught about my entire life. You're the one, and you fit all of the criteria that the rabbis and the priests have been teaching all of these years. You're the one that Scripture has talked about. You are the one we've been watching. Can you, can you discern what time of dispensation you're in? Do we, do we know where we're at in the dispensations and the times of God. See, God had a plan for a 2,000 year period that we will generically call the church age. There's the time of the law and the prophets all the way back, the time of creation. How I many of y'all know God's really intentional? He's really good at what He does. He sees the end from the beginning. He has a plan. And so as we look at the prevailing church, 
This passage that you're reading, now look with me at Matthew 16 and 18, and this is where I want to bring focus to. This will be our umbrella passage as we go through this series and we go through this study. We're going to see what God's plan was for the church, what God's plan is for the church. Why? And understand this. Now listen, let me say this right off the bat. The church is not the building. How many of all know that? If we ever learned anything through this whole COVID thing, we ought to learn that the church isn't the building, Amen. The church isn't something that just happens on Sunday morning. Church, listen to me, church is not an event. Lean in now. Church is not an event. It is an experience. Now listen to me. It is an experience in relationship with God. Actually, it's in relationship with Jesus and in fellowship with God and one another. That's a good thing. Amen. What is the function of the church? What is the authority and the power of the church? What's the position of the church? What's God's plan for the church? Because the church is not a building. We call this the house of God. Listen, a bunch of guys met over here yesterday. We chopped up big trees, big storm blew through here, right? Thank God nobody got injured, right? Thank God we can replace fences and trees and all that kind of stuff. This building could have blown away just as those trees across the street blew away. How many of y'all know we're going to have church today whether there's a house or not? We are going to have church today. Church is not a building. It is not an event. Church is a relationship. It's an experience in relation. It's a real experience. It's between me and, it's between me and my Lord. Between It's fellowship between me and my heavenly Father. Father God, His Son Jesus, and His precious Holy Spirit. Triune Godhead. So how do we learn about the church? How do we get information? Where do we see pictures? I'm a visual learner. Anybody else here besides me visual learner? If I can see it and I can hear it, and if I can touch it and, can, and see it, and that, that's how I learn. And so when I begin to see pictures of the church... Throughout Scripture, it begins to give me understanding of what God's intention, what the function of the church, what God's priorities are for the church. And so the first one that I see is in Genesis. We're going to go there in a moment. But I want us to look at, and we're going to read this, if we could, I want you to put Matthew 16 and 18 up, and we're going to read that one, Miss Kathy. Matthew 16 and 18. And this is Jesus' response back to Peter. Verse 17, I should say this, he, he, he calls out blessing. Verse 17, when Peter answered correctly, he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this. Let's back up to 17. I need to hit this one right here, prompted real quickly by the Spirit of God. The blessing that we're talking about is a blessing whenever, as we study the churches, by the time we get to the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, we will go from Genesis to Revelation in this one because it's all throughout the Scripture. God had a plan from the beginning all the way through the end. How many all believe that? The church is not some hip pocket, shoot from the hip kind of a thing. He's got a plan all the way through. By the time we get to study the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, he will use this term with all seven churches. Seven churches... <laughs> Seven times he says, to him that overcomes, and seven times he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. Blessing, because you can hear. It's one thing for you to be able to hear my voice, and that in your physical eardrum, and the way that God created the physical body. How we all know it's more important that you can hear in your spirit man? that you can hear in this part of you. We're made in that image of God. We'll talk some more about that. But that I can hear. We're very familiar with the physical person. Uh, doctors, nurses, we study all of these different things, and we've got a really pretty good understanding of this. The soulish person, the, the mind, the will, the emotions, the soul, we've got a pretty good grasp of that. We understand the mind, the psychology of things. We understand the will and the emotions that come along in all of our being. But the spirit part of us, the part that's made after God, we struggle with understanding something. It's invisible. We're not as well versed. We're not as well studied. And so what does God teach us about the invisible man? The hidden man is what the apostle said on the hidden man of the heart on the inside. 
do we understand that man in detail. And so that's what we're going to explore and see how that all pulls together right here. Now, blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has revealed this to you. He heard. Now listen to me. The blessing comes not just because you hear my voice, but because you hear the voice of God in your life. Is that accurate? Can I say that? Be, huh? Blessed are you, Peter. Now he's getting ready to change his name. Simon Barjona. Simon, the son of Jonah. That's what Barjona means. Simon, the son of Jonah. That's Peter's given name. Now next verse. Now next verse. Father from heaven, reveal this to you. I say unto you that thou art Peter. Petros. Petros means a fragment of a rock. That's literally what I mean. Petros, Peter, you are a fragment of a rock. Then he says this right here. Thou art Peter, the fragment of the rock, and upon this rock, Petra. Everybody say Petra. Petra is a huge, massive rock. It is a, it, it's a monstrous sized rock. How many of y'all know? And upon this rock. A whole bunch of rocks come together. A whole bunch of us coming together in unison, in one mind, in one accord, and in one body. And upon this rock, listen, I'll build my church. Everybody say His church. This is not my church. This is His church. What's been happening for the last few years in this community and what you've seen put on display for the last few weeks is a group of pastors finally starting to catch the heart of God and figuring out it ain't my church and your church and their church. It's His church. And that's a good thing. It's a really good thing. And when we begin to come, how many of y'all know whenever he makes it personal? His church. And then this is the line. And the very gates of hell. Everybody say the gates of hell. Won't prevail again. It. In other words, it don't mean that they won't try to prevail. It don't mean that you get a free pass just because you become part of the church, right? It means that the gates of hell may try. I'm nearly sure they will. No weapon formed against me says that weapons will be formed against me. The rest of that verse just says they won't prosper. The gates of hell. Anybody ever felt like the gates of hell just got opened up and unleashed on you? Huh? I'm not looking for information. I understand. I get it. And so, when we talk about the prevailing church, we're talking about His church first. It doesn't have anything to do with a denomination. It has everything to do with a Savior. It has everything to do with a Deliverer. It has everything to do with Lord. It's not about an event that happens on Sunday morning. It's not about a special event that happens somewhere. It's not about a building. It's about God's family. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ and others, and it's about a fellowship with the Heavenly Father. The gates of hell won't prevail. Everybody say prevailing church. Prevailing church. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and we're going to get our first picture. Now, there, in that passage that we just read, where Jesus declares, my church, my church is going to prevail against the very gates of hell, that's the first time that church is used in, in Scripture right there. And the definition, now listen, we'll be working on this some more. I'm just going to give you, a, we're just doing an intro today. The definition is the ecclesia, that's the Greek word for church, and it literally means those who are called out, the called out ones. Look over at your neighbor and tell them you've been called out. Well, what does that even mean? You've been called out. What does that mean? You've been called out of darkness into what? Marvelous light. You've been called out of sin into righteousness. You've been called out of defeat into victory. And we can follow on through. How many of all believe the church has been called to prevail? You've been called. And at the end of this thing, we've been called out of this world and we've been called to an eternal home. Anybody say amen? amen. Either it's true or it's not true. What you believe matters, and what you do with what you believe matters just as much. I believe that Jesus is who He says He is. Now then, Genesis 1 and 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image in the likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the things, over everything that creeps. Look over at your neighbor and tell him you've got, huh, you have dominion over creeps. Okay? You have dominion over creep, so if you're dealing with a creep in your life, just take authority. Amen. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. We're going to talk about that more in weeks to come. God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them, and God blessed. Ever say, God blessed. God blesses the work of his hands because it's good. Hmm? He blessed them, and God said unto them, and here's where, you, here's where we're going to start talking about 
the, 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 the first revelation, the first pictures of the church that we begin to, to, to get right here. There are five commands. The five original commands to man. And if you follow this, you can follow it all the way through Scripture. And it's still in effect today to the church. Ephesians chapter 5. I'll jump ahead. We'll get there in a little bit. We'll close there just in a moment. But in Ephesians 5, he talks about husbands and wives, Christ and the church. Right? Starting in verse 21, 22. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Everybody say, even as. Amen. There's a parallel. And so when we look at the story of Adam and Eve, we can, that's the first Adam and the mother of all living, that's Eve. We can look at the picture of the second Adam, who is Jesus, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, second Adam, who is Jesus, and the church, who is the body, the bride, one flesh, bone of bone, flesh of flesh. Okay, you'll, I'm going fast. Rewatch it on YouTube or something a little bit later and check out the Scripture. God blessed them and God said unto them, everybody say five commands. Still in effect today. This is you. Let's establish this. How many of y'all believe that Jesus is the head of the church? Right? He's the head and we're the body. Everybody good with that one? We've heard lots of teaching on that and we're good with that. So let me, let me, let me, let me phrase it this way. Let me, let me frame it like this. How many of y'all believe that the head is victorious? Jesus, the head, is prevailing. How can the head prevail unless the body prevail also? Makes sense, doesn't it? The prevailing church, the body of Christ. And so as we go through this, He gives us these five commands. Everybody say, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue. I thought we were in paradise. I thought we were in Eden. What is there to subdue? What is there to conquer? What is there to prevail? What is there to overcome? This is the Garden of Eden. It's perfect here. There's a snake in the garden. How many of y'all know there's still a snake in the garden? Amen. Huh? How many of y'all know there's still some things you do and some things you don't do? Don't you eat of that. How many of y'all know there's a few things you don't need to be partaking of? Everybody say amen. amen. Still true all the way across. And we need to make sure that we continue to teach these lessons. Hmm? All the way through. They don't change just because we flip the page on the calendar or we get another year. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and have dominion. Prevail. Overcome. Triumph victoriously over. The fish... I like triumphing over fish. I like baptizing them in hot oil. It's a very spiritual experience. Jesus was into it himself. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to go, yeah. Can I just say that the lockdown has been very good to me? All right. Over the fowl of the air. Turkey season just ended, unless you're a redneck. And it never ends. All right, so over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Chapter 2, verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Now we're going to start digging in. So, so we start getting some direction. Here's what God says to Adam and to Eve. I've created you to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue, and have dominion. Five commands. Now we're going to build on the parallel just a little bit more. Verse 18, chapter 2, And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. Everybody say, It's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a help meet, is the way it says it in the King James. You're looking at King James up here. Literally, a help mate. Two words. Help and mate. For him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them, to ever Adam called them, every living creature, that was the name thereof. Adam gave names to all the cattle, the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. Listen to this. But for Adam, there was not a helpmate found. There was nothing on earth that had the same nature the same being. There's fish, there's birds, there's beasts, there's all of these things, but there's only one man, 
Adam, and there's no other living being that has the same nature. And so for that same nature, what happens is, when we read this on down, it's not good for man to be alone. So Adam has no one with the same nature. Let me interject this. How many of y'all know that when Jesus came, died, resurrected, there was no one with the same nature? The divine nature is what Second Peter. Huh? According as His divine power hath given unto us, listen to this, all things that pertain unto life and God. Now this is Second Peter chapter 1, verses, two, or verses 3 and 4. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that's called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Listen to this, here's the line. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Everybody say divine nature. Nobody had the same nature as Jesus, the second Adam, just like nobody had the same nature as Adam, the first Adam. You, are you with me? We're, we're, we're looking at a picture here. We're looking at God setting up this, this, this program, this teaching, this training in the minds of those that would, would be following His Word and getting them ready for the coming Messiah so that they wouldn't miss. And I guarantee you, Peter was familiar with this. Amen? Peter knew about the writings of Moses. Peter knew about Genesis. And when he said, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God, he was able to recognize because the criteria had been met. He'd been being taught and trained about this all of his life. The Lord God, this is verse 21, caused a deep sleep. We're going to run a parallel here now. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And as he slept, he took one of his ribs, he closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, hmm? and brought her unto the man. And Adam looked up and said, hubba hubba, right? <laughs> Woo hoo. Whoa, man. Yeah. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now let's run parallel. That's the story. We're familiar with it. Eve, so Jesus is on the cross. And there's a deep sleep. Hmm? And his side is opened up. Remember what come forth out of his side? Blood and water. You're exactly right. And out of his side was formed... Hmm? The bride of Christ. Very good, Mary Lee. You're following right along. The bride of Christ formed out of his side. The sleep. And he's paying the penalty. He's paying the price so that there could be... It's not good for him to be alone. So he's paying the price so that someone can be made with the same nature. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? So we're starting to get a picture of Adam and Eve and Christ and the church. It's beautiful, isn't it? It really is. And when you begin to understand this, listen, God knew what He was doing from day one. From the beginning to the end, He had a plan. He's not shooting from the hip saying, well, we'll figure it out as we go. That's how I do it. How about you? Huh? I don't know exactly what we're going to do, but God will lead me. Oh, God, lead me. Oh, God, right? He's got a plan was taken out of man. Now, listen to this right here because this is going to come into play just in a moment. Verse 23, I'm just going to read it again. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, let's go to Genesis verse three and, or chapter 3 and verse 20. Important thing here, and this is for Mother's Day. I want to just include this one because of Mother's Day. And Adam called his wife name. You've got to be careful, fellas, how you read this. Punctuation is really important. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. If you change it any at all, and Adam called his wife names, how many all know that can get you in big trouble? <laughs> I just... That didn't cost you anything. That's just free. That's just a little marital advice, fellas. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. Everybody say Eve. Eve. Because she was what? The mother of all living. Happy Mother's Day. The mother of all living. 
Now, why is that important in this message? Because if Adam and Eve are a picture of Christ and the church, guess what the church's job is? Guess where the church fits in this thing? The church should be in a place where it is bringing new life. Anybody think anybody ought to ever get saved? Anybody ought to ever get born again? Somebody ought to get delivered? Somebody ought to get free? I know you do. That's Scripture. But that's not your first job. Now, if we studied all the rest of the book of Genesis right here or the rest of these first three chapters, how many of all know that when God created Adam and Eve, He sets them in this garden. There is a serpent there. There's some period of time that goes through. God's coming down. And Father God comes down and has fellowship daily with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve representing Christ in the church. How many all know we need to have daily fellowship? That's just a simple parallel that it's teaching us right there. But it also teaches us this, is that there needs to be, first of all, a personal relationship with Jesus. Everybody say personal relationship. So that's what the, that, when I ask people this question, and it's not to be a trick question for anybody, but when I ask people what the first thing the church is supposed to do, most of them say, fulfill the Great Commission, go into all the world, and, and right? And, and that is part of the function, but the first function, listen to me, the most important part of you being a part of the church is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That trumps everything. You can't give what you don't have. You can't walk where you have not been. You, can't, you cannot go there unless you... You can't... Listen to me. Let's put it this way. You can't be a life giver if you don't have life. How about that? So we can all, we can all get with that one, right? You can't be a life giver if you don't have life. Listen. The dead do not procreate. Huh? They do not. Only life can produce life. Amen. Simple concept. Eve, the mother of all living. Now Ephesians 5, and we're going we're to just get into this just a little bit, and then I'm going to close. We're out of time uh, for today. And again, this is a series. Ephesians chapter 5 and starting at verse 21. Uh, whenever, whenever I do pre-marriage counseling or sometimes uh, uh, after intense fellowship with husbands and wives counseling... Uh, I, yeah, I caught that. Thank you. The husbands love it. Those that are Bible readers, they love it when I say, let's go over to Ephesians chapter 5, and they're sitting on the edge waiting for verse 22. Verse 22 says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. And they can't wait till I get into that part of the lesson. Here's the deal. <laughs> Stay with me now. Don't, don't miss this one. Here's your mathematics lesson for the day. Verse 21 precedes verse 22. Verse 21 is extremely important so you can understand verses 22 and there on through. Verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in what? The fear of God. Keep that one in mind. We're going to come back to it. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands, right? Let's go on to verse 22. As unto, everybody say, as unto the Lord. Now we're starting to see a parallel come to fruition again. We're starting to see the picture begin to be made plainer again. Uh, the, the lenses are being cleared off. It's kind of like cleaning your glasses, right? And you can see a little bit clearer on this whole thing. As unto the Lord. Here's what I've figured out about my relationship with my precious bride of almost 41 years come June. Not a record, but ought to count for something. Yay, Marcia, she's a good woman. Very blessed, very blessed. You're a very fortunate woman. I remind her all the time. I do. I don't think I don't. I do. Yeah, humility is one of my strong suits. It really is. I'm really proud of how humble I am. And, and uh, some of you got that one. Stay with me. It's been a long time since I've been in the pulpit. I'm having fun today. And so... In this room. Every night when she tucks the kids in, the grandkids to stay at the house and stuff like that, she'll be talking to Grace and Grace and you're, little, you're my little superhero. You're, you're my little superman. You're, you're my little spider man. You're my little ninja turtle man. And then she gets done with Grace and she comes and says the same things to me and tucks me in. And it's just the nicest, beautiful, most beautiful. She's just so sweet. I love it. I mean, it's... okay, wow. My kids do not. I hear Mandy mumbling over here. 
You didn't know that your daddy had Spidey PJs too, right? Wow, right. All right, I don't want to go there. Okay, let's get off of that. So Marsha says, I'm getting some. I, not really, okay, I don't. But she says, I'm getting some for, they don't make them in this size. You think so? It'll be just like when you tried to buy skinny jeans for me. All right, so they don't make those in 5217s either. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. just lost it. Squirrel. Okay, sorry, stay with me. So <laughs> wives, submit yourselves, and that's the end of it. We're done. As unto the Lord. What I've learned in our relationship, the more I act like Jesus, the less problem she has in submission. Anybody say amen? amen. Just a real easy lesson. Now, the next verse, verse 23, for the husband's ahead of the wife, everybody say, even as. Yes. Everybody see we're talking parallel truth? Even as. Just like. The same as. Even as. Husband's. The head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. Now, next verse, verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. And the husbands all said, as they looked at their wives, Amen. So be it. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. There's this phrase again. Everybody say, even as. Again, parallel truth. We're learning about Adam and Eve and Christ and the church. We're learning about, listen to me, the covenant of marriage. Covenant relationship. Everybody say covenant relationship. It's powerful. See, listen, when you understand the covenant and the power of the covenant, it will set the body free to walk in the same prevailing power and glory that the head walks in. It's a powerful thing. It's a powerful teaching. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the, cho uh, loved the church. Everybody say, even as. Amen. So we come back to this. Listen, if you're having trouble at home, here's your little free advice, husbands. If you'll just act like Jesus, your wife won't have near as much trouble with you. There won't be, the intense fellowship will lessen and lessen. It's kind of the same thing as when the church is being disobedient or back up in God's face, back up in the Lord Jesus' face, saying, no, I ain't going to do that. Is he Savior and Lord? Or are you just wanting fire insurance and he's Savior? There's a difference in Savior and Lord. We kind of just lump them together and make this, when he's Lord, it's yes, sir, and you're the boss and Okay. Amen? Yeah. Okay. Husbands, love your wives. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify, cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. That he might present it to himself, glorious church. Everybody say glorious church. There's another picture of the church. The glorious ecclesia, the glorious called out. What, hap what would happen if the glory of God really got in this church? What would happen if the glory of God really got in this congregation? Again, not just inside the wall, but inside this church, inside us. The spots removed, the wrinkles ironed out. We, when we talk about the church, a lot of people talk about the persecuted church. How many all know the persecution? There's been a lot of people tortured to death. Let me tell you what I think about the American church. The American church ain't been tortured to death. We've been hugged to death. We've been coddled and we've had it so easy and we've had it so nice. And there's a little portion of me that's kind of glad that all this has went down went down because it's a reminder of the blessing that we have and the freedom to assemble ourselves and come together and worship our God. Amen. I haven't been liking it much more than anybody else and I'm glad. I'm happy to get back together today. Amen. With the stroke of a pen, a governor or a president or a congress, and all of that taken away. Let me say this, and we'll, we'll build on this some. It's a, it's a hard thing to get back ground that you have surrendered. Enough said. Now, uh, Aaron, if you want to come up, I'm going to, I'm going to start wrapping up right here. Uh, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men... 
to love their wives as their own body. He that loves his wife loves himself. No man yet ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes. Everybody say nourish and cherish. We're going to spend some time on that next week. Nourish and cherish. You have to feed a healthy relationship. How many all know that? Doesn't matter even if it's in husband and wife. How many all know if you're going to have a healthy friendship? Huh? You have to you have to feed a healthy relationship. And so that's based off of value. Everybody say cherish. Cherish is a term of value. Because I cherish this relationship, I'm going to do what is within my power to nourish this relationship. So we're going to go all the way back up to verse 21 now. We're going to tie this together and we're going to finish for today. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear, the reverence of Almighty God. How many of y'all know that Adam and Eve were supposed to be submitted, working, sharing, tilling the garden, taking care of business on earth in respect and reverence, knowing that God would be coming to visit them that day? Hmm? What does submission... See, that's a word, I, I'll be honest with you, in my English, in my American mindset, I don't like that word, submission. I ain't submitting to nobody. I ain't, you try to put your thumb on... Don't tread on me! Right? That's kind of our American mindset. But in a healthy... Now listen to me, everybody say healthy. In a healthy relationship, that word submit literally means... I'm going to serve and I'm going to bless, just like Christ served and blessed. How many of y'all know things are a lot better at home when husbands are serving and blessing and the wife's response to that is, well, if you think you can be a blessing, I'll show you blessing, mister. Huh? See, what happens in so many households what happens in so many churches is we sit and we give the stink eye across the aisle maybe or we've got memories of past disappointments or I don't know if I approve or not but what happens in a church when we truly can come to a place where we cherish one another I value you hey gang I missed you I missed you guys I miss those that are watching. I'm thankful we got to have church like we did. I'm glad I don't have to have church with seven preachers again today. <laughs> and, share it. and share it, yeah. I love those guys. I really do. And we're trying to learn how to walk in this and model it. To truly cherish one another. For pastors to say, listen, man. We don't agree on everything. We're all big boys and we all know what we believe and why we believe it. But you know, on the really important things, we have figured out that on those tier one, we can come together. And because I value them and because they value me, we cherish one another. Just as first service was starting, I literally, when I started to get up to preach, my phone lit up and it was a, a text message from Pastor Dennis at Crossway. And he said, hey, dude, I miss you. Been loving having all this time together. So I'm really glad to be back in church. I want you to have a glorious day. That was really good to my heart. Especially after the way I've been talking about them. <laughs> if you guys happen to watch, I do love you. You know that. We have a meeting at 12 o'clock Tuesday. My office, be there, don't be late. All right. So, and that is true. Um... We feed that relationship. We've been nourishing that relationship. And that's what it's supposed to look like. And so in your home, when, when, when church, when this group really gets to doing good is when your home's doing really good. I can't give what I don't have. If I can't live this out with the person that I've taken vows with, that I've made covenant with. And listen, here's the truth. How many of y'all know you don't get a free pass? It ain't all been roses. It's hard to live with somebody that's right all the time. I almost made a mistake once. And again, that humility thing comes up now and again. To live with somebody as humble as I am. All right, you guys stand.
we're going to we're going to finish up right here submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God had Adam and Eve truly walked in submission like they were supposed to and they did for a while and we all know that some of the things that we see in the mess in this world wouldn't be like it is today now I want to go on down that's verse 21 I read verse 29 about nourishing and cherishing we're going to come back to that and I'm going to read verse 30 you've heard these words again you've heard these words before I'm going to read them again we, we just read them back in Genesis 2 so from 2,000 years ago these words come alive to us today in the New Testament but from way back before that, Moses hmm, pins the words of the Genesis account. The creation of man and woman. And he paints a picture of what the body of Christ should look like. The intimacy. Verse 30. For we are members of his body. He's on a cross. He's in a deep sleep. And he didn't die so we would fight with one another. Huh? He died so we would love him and what we receive in that love and what we receive in that grace and what we receive in the beauty of his presence out of our innermost being, out of our cup being filled to overflowing, that same love could flow to one another, that we could truly cherish one another, that we could truly love one another. Wouldn't church be an awesome place if people could really just lay down the agendas and just really love one another I just care about you and so I just want to serve and I want to bless you and the response from the heart was well I really want to serve and bless you too and we create this place where there's just blessing that don't mean that we ignore or that we <laughs> if there's things see he chastises those whom he loves he corrects the wrong but those are faithful wounds. Those are not meant to hurt. Those are faithful wounds. I've got some people that I know that are just, they're, they're strong men. I, I, let me say that I thank God for my executive board. You have a wonderful executive board in this church. And I thank God for men and women on that board that can come to me and say, hey, D.L., we need to think about this right here. We need to look at this right here. How many of y'all know people that, listen, when you know somebody really loves you and they're not trying to hurt you, but that you're on the same side, you're yoked together and you're going the same direction, they have permission. They've earned the permission and they've earned the right to speak things into our life that's sometimes hard for us to hear, but that we need to hear. Anybody say amen? And don't have to get all offended about it. When was the last time you was offended with your spouse? When was the last time, huh? Pretty easy to come. I'm not looking for information, gang. It's Mother's Day. I'm going to go eat a hamburger here in a little bit. <laughs> We're going to celebrate. Just thinking in these terms right here. Bone of bone. Flesh of flesh. Mary Lee's got a word. She wants something to share. When I can, when I can trust this lady enough to say, okay, I want you to be able to get close enough that you can speak into this mic. And I want you to hear, unplanned and unprepared. Okay? Did my mic go dead? Am I dead? No, I'm still on. All right. I can't, I can't thank God enough for bringing me here today and this, the privilege and the way he works. I didn't want to interrupt David, but he's talking and he's saying, you know, speak come and speak trust somebody come and speak it's like oh lord okay i had the privilege of seeing something about uh go back to matthew 16 verse 18 and this is in caesarea philippi mm -hmm. i saw this visually a few weeks ago and there is a cliff mountain there mm -hmm. out of which came forth gushing water from springs from mountains full of 
full of snow further mm. away. It was a beautiful place, ponds, gorgeous, spring-fed, or anyway, beautiful water, fresh, live water. However, into that rock, mm. the pagans had dug these niches, mm. and they had their ashtar, I believe it was, these idols, idols. up right. in these huh. niches, in that rock. Huh. And it was all around surrounding this um, massive rock, yeah. Massive rock full of these niches, out of which came forth this water gushing, and they had columns in front of it. And this was called the Gates of Hell. Ah. This was the Gates of Hell. This uh, verse 18, Matthew 16, 18, was the disciples' bar mitzvah. Hmm. He brought his disciples, knowing in a few weeks he was going to be dead. Yeah, that's right. And he brought them here, and he showed them this beautiful place where they sacrificed. These pagans were sacrificing. They were drowning their babies in these pools mm. and, and worshiping these idols. And the rock that he's talking about, just as you pointed out, the rock was not Peter. That's the right. rock was hell itself and yeah. the evil and and the evil that was going forth and God was covering that rock yeah and the gates of hell would not prevail yeah his church was going to be overcoming that that's good and that that uh hole where the water came forth no longer spews water and now, you know, they're taking Christian groups there and they are not sacrificing babies anymore. Thank God. And, but it's, a, it's an amazing thing. I mean, it's so powerful that he brought his disciples there and he told Shows them, them the church is going to prevail Prevailed. over this. Right there. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Good word. Thank you. Isn't that good? Yeah. I love to hang out with people who study and who know. I did not know that. I honestly didn't. That's what a great word. And again, another picture of that prevailing church. So here's, here's what I want us to leave with. Here's, here's where we're done at. Um, the body of Christ in the plan of God is to operate as the husband and wife in close relationship. And then we walk in close relationship as we cherish and as we nourish one another, the blessing of God begins to flow. And then from the blessing of God comes fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and have dominion. So we're going to pray. For husbands and wives that maybe got some things you need to get straightened out, right now is a really good time to start. If you look across the aisle, if you think somebody down at the other church and there's something in your heart toward them, when their name comes up and your mind automatically flashes to an offense of some kind or a disappointment of some kind, hey, it ain't worth it. Let it go. It's just a big distraction. And let's walk in the prevailing power, the glorious church that He's called us to be, a prevailing church is built out of prevailing Christians, believers. I mean, I want to walk in what God's paid for for us. I do too. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We invite your presence into our daily life and into our daily walk. We ask you to forgive us, Lord God, where we have failed and where we have made mistakes. Sometimes we've done it intentionally. We've let anger rule us and overcome us. Revenge, shame and guilt and condemnation sometimes talk. We want to get back at somebody so we tear them down with words. And when you tell us that we're to serve one another, we're to bless one another, we're to humble ourselves and submit and to care for them just like we care for our own flesh. That Adam would take care of Eve and provide and protect and take care of and Eve would take care of and it wasn't good for them to be alone for a while they're the only two that has that nature there's not another one there like them 
a special bond and a special union. You're the only one that has that same spiritual nature that we have on the inside, Lord God. And there's something in us created in the image of God. There's something in our spirit man that longs to have deep, meaningful relationship with you. Heads bowed right here and nobody looking around, please. Close them up. Altars are open again. If you want to come, come pray. We want to pray with you. Here's where I want you to be very real with what you believe. What do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about God? What what are you doing with what you believe? And so if nobody else, I'd like to be the one praying for you. I won't call your name. I'm not going to... I would never embarrass or humiliate anyone intentionally. I just want to... So I won't call your name. I just want to pray for you. If you're here or you're watching, and you say, listen, I'm just not where I need to be with God. I'm not walking it out like I need to. I know that God's got more, and I just got some things messed up. Would you pray for me? Could I just see your hand? Amen. Yeah. Hands, hands. Yeah. More. Good. Good. Thank you for being honest. I love you. God loves you. Several, several hands. For those who are watching the same thing, I can't see your hands, but I'm confident there are those there. I want you to know that He cherishes you. Isn't that a beautiful word? Cherishes you. And that He wants to feed you. He wants to nourish you. His grace is abundant. And so here's what we're going to do. We're just going to take just a moment. And then we are done. And ask God to forgive. God to fill us and to lead us. And get our feet back on the right path. Can we do that? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. We close it down today, Lord God. We're so thankful we've got to join together again and come. And my goodness, we've missed the fellowship with one another. We've missed just that nearness and relationship you created us as relational beings lord god and so good to see so good to share a handshake a hug just to be in the same place together and get to visit and catch up lord god you long to have that spiritual deep, meaningful, intimate relationship with us. It's vital to our survival, to our life. The prevailing church to be fruitful, multiply and replenish. To walk in victory, subdue, more than conquerors, dominion. We can talk those things with our mouth, but if we don't own those things in our heart and in our spirit. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us our sin, for forgiving us our failures, for making a way. You are the way maker, the miracle worker, our healer. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And pray for healing for marriages, relationships, our relationship with you, And Lord God, if we walk where you've called us to walk, just as Eve, the mother of all living, is a life giver, church needs to be a life-giving place. It needs to be an experience. And life produced from that. Go with us now. Draw us near to you. Every step, every move, we give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, everybody agreed, said amen. Hey, go burn your hot dog at Mother's Day. Go all in. Maybe somewhere nice like Taco Bell. I don't know. Whatever's up, you know. Get it on. We love you. Hey, have you heard the one about the uh, Hindu priest? and the? That's an old one. You guys have already heard that one, right?